Welcome to a very special edition of The Road to Hollywood. It's, we've been waiting for this. We, we, we've been inviting her for a, a few months now. <laughs> but we are so excited to have our friend Violet Brown in the studio with us. Welcome, Violet. Hello. Glad to be here tonight, finally. It's, yeah, you know, when, when we put the idea of the show together, the whole idea was to, to bring together so many of the great you know, speakers that we bring out to IES, so many of the great people in the industry, in a little more of a relaxed mode, you know, rather than being in front of a big, you know, room of people and, you know, that we can talk a little deeper, we can go behind the scenes, you know, we can get a little more information out there. and it's it's archived so people can watch this forever. So it's really uh, exciting to spread the word. I must say that, you know, being someone that's been involved decades myself in, in, in the industry and loving music all my life, it's always great to find someone that has that passion, that passion for not only, you know, enjoying the music, we always stay a fan, but to help help the artists, to really nurture great music, because we know that it not only brings ourselves the joy of, of, you know, being able to appreciate that music, but just seeing the world a better place, you know, by music. And Violet, please tell us a little bit about, you know, how you got so, you know, infatuated with music, how it led to you actually wanting to do this as a career and, of course, leading to, you know, the warehouse and, you know, the birth of such a great time in music. Well, for me, it basically started from a child collecting records. You know, I uh, grew up around the corner from a little indie record store, and uh, every penny I would get, allowance, whatever it was, I would spend money on 45s back in the day. You gotta and, tell me, what was the first 45? Oh gosh, <laughs> uh, probably something like the Twist or something wow. like that. You know, it was just a long time ago. But I used to spend like all my money on 45s, and so I had a huge collection of singles. Uh, and then, you know, I started collecting albums and such. And um, you know, this started really when I was like five, six years old, I started collecting singles. And so I had to have like whatever came out. Back in the day, the way they used to sell them was there was a stack of 10 singles and then and it would be really cheap. And in the middle there would be, or in the ends where you could see there would be a couple of great singles and the inside would be all stuff that you never heard of or whatever. But you know, you would find some gems in there. So I collected mm. singles and um, had a huge record collection. So of course, it school I was the person that brought the music to school dances and house parties and things like that so um, when I was about 12 years old there was a local swap meet near me which was the rhodium swap meet in Gardena mm -hmm. And I used to hang out there and beg to work on the weekends. And I would beg to work on the weekends for money to buy more music, more records, you know. And so there was a group of, there was a uh, person that was there that sold four and eight track tapes. And uh, they said, you know, well, we don't really hire kids here or whatever, but, you know, maybe you could help us set up, close down, tear down at the end of the day and stuff like that. So I started working for them and waiting on customers at the swap meet, and I knew all the music that people were ask, was asking for. Mm. And I knew more about the music than the guy that was running it. So he said, why don't you come to my house during the weekday when we're making these tapes and uh, help me put them together? And back then, you know, it's kind of like, uh, I guess, mixtapes now, y you know, it was more like compilations, but I would tell him what to put on these tapes. And at that time, it was not illegal. Uh, copyright laws weren't in place and that sort of thing. So you could actually take a legendary album, copy it, and sell it without any problem back then. Hmm. So these people, they had a little record store in Lawndale, California. And from the time of 12 to 15, I worked for them at the swap meet. And the tapes that I would tell them to make became super popular. And they started wholesaling them to all the other um, swap meet people across LA. Mm -hmm. And then they started shipping them out and stuff like that. So they were doing really well. So I guess to juice me and make me feel like important, they started putting my name on them, like Violet 1, Violet 2, that sort of oh. thing. And so um, when I was 15, again, to keep me on hooked with them they said why don't you take over our little store in lawndale and just pay us at the end of the week for what you sell you know and i was in high school 
And I was uh, kind of a popular kid in high school because I was involved in a lot of the different clubs and I was in school, you know, bands and in theater and all that. So I knew everybody, you know, I knew everybody in my city. So I said, sure, I'll take it over. So I took over the store. It became super popular. I did all the promotion at school and all the neighboring schools and things like that. I would have jam sessions in the store on Friday nights. I invested you know, with the music money into head shop gear and started selling stuff like that, had, you know, lights and black lights and candle, you know, Mm -hmm. all this stuff. And so um, that store actually stayed open until about 1984. uh, But somewhere around uh, seven, I, I think it was right as I got out of high school, I wanted to work in music, but the copyright laws had changed, so we couldn't sell those types of tapes anymore. So I went to work for another chain, which was Wallach's Music City, which was a big chain in Los Angeles at the time, before Tower and all that. They was were this like, the one at Sunset and Vine? Yeah, they had one on Sunset and Vine. I worked in the one in Torrance and helped out a lot in the singles department at the one in uh, Hollywood. Mm. And, you know, big legendary in-store was there they would shut down the store because the Beatles were shopping in there and you know it was like a crazy place to work it was like Capitol Records right up the block yeah it had the popularity I guess uh, that Amoeba does now you know it was the store you know and then later on Tower Sunset opened and Mm -hmm. our store shut down after a while or whatever Mm -hmm. but I uh, you know still collected records worked in record stores and one time i had a, a car that was driving um from my job in the los angeles area to the south bay where i worked and i got a flat tire and i had my records in the back of the car and i didn't want to leave them in the back of the car so i took take them out and I'm carrying them with me and I go up to this bar that was on the corner and I said you guys got a phone because of course this was right before the cell phones everybody had a cell phone so I uh, the guy said yeah come on in we got a phone here so I was using the phone and the guy at the bar he goes what is that in that box and I said these are records he goes you're kidding can I see them so he starts looking at them he goes oh my god you got all kinds of cool stuff here and I said yeah and uh, he said well we we have a, a DJ that plays here dance music he goes why don't you come back later on tonight and bring your records and I said well, I've never DJed in a you know a bar or club or anything. And he goes, well, just come bring your music. So I said, okay, you know. So I went back, brought my music, walked into the club, and the club was uh, there was no there was no white folks in the club at all, just me with my blonde hair. And I got in the DJ booth, and the whole dance floor looked in the DJ booth like was mortified what is she doing in there whatever you know and the guy started showing me how to play records and play records at that time and Mm -hmm. so um, they really you know once I started playing my music and they heard it the crowd just went crazy so I started like going there like every weekend spinning and that sort of thing which led me to more DJ jobs and uh, eventually I found my way as a music buyer with warehouse music and uh, um, now, that what you, job. What year was that? What didn't you start? Oh boy! I think originally it was in 1975 when I started there with wow. warehouse, and I stayed all the way till the bitter end when yeah. they were sold to another company, and I also went to work t- with that company for a while, mm-hmm. uh, which was Trans World Entertainment, that owns the Fye chain. Yeah. So uh, you know I. Um, was pretty successful as a music buyer and because of that I was allowed to do other things on the side which you know I was very involved with all the record labels so I would shop artists to labels or I would uh, be asked to do compilations for different labels I had an album that I produced alongside with uh, Priority Records called In the Beginning There Was Rap Mm -hmm. that did really well I managed artists Continued to DJ. I did that for 26 years at, and also, you know, kept buying, put on big events, huge events, uh, festivals at USC. Uh, we did uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, 
you know, events in the back of my store. Mm -hmm. uh, we would have block parties where a lot of gigantic artists would play for free for the community. It was always free once a year during Black Music Month. I would have something really big. And, uh, you know, I just have always worked in music. I've never worked outside of music. Yes. And I, I just love it. You know, I was responsible for... Uh, rap and well, let's, let's I was there. I was that. there at the beginning of rap when what, it first started. What was the started. first hip hop record you ever heard? Uh, whew. I don't remember the first record I ever heard, but I remember the first record that I totally went bananas and over the top for it was Planet Rock. Mm -hmm. And I had heard I had heard rap records definitely before Planet Rock, but that was the one that really like I got to have this record and I got to have it right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just really changed my life after that. You know? Well, you know, we, we know hip hop started in New York, but it, you were right there when the evolution, you know, when it, when it grew from out here. And I know there was a lot of, you know, block parties or the Uncle Jam's Army and all that. Mm -hmm. talk, talk about the spirit in those early days, Ice-T and, of course, meeting Eric Wright, who became the entrepreneur of Easy e and... You know, his friend Dr. Dre. Well, Talk about that era and how you met these guys. You know, it was fun being the rap buyer for a chain that had stores all over the country. And, you know, I definitely paid attention to hip hop everywhere, you know, throughout the country. But being here on the West Coast, everybody kind of linked me with West Coast uh, rap. So um, a lot of the artists would come to me when they needed um you know, to, to have a label hear them or possibly when they needed a meeting at K-Day radio station and that sort of thing. So um, I got to meet, like, all the West Coast hip-hop stars and legends back when they were first starting out, you know, which was pretty cool. You know, uh, Eric Wright, Easy e was a friend of mine and uh you know my kids watched some of his kids sometimes babysat them um uh i knew you know him from the rhodium swap meet where it was years after i had been there but i met him through steve yano at the rhodium swap meet and became friends with eric and um Steve, you know, was involved with making the radio record with Greg Mack and that sort of thing. And uh, so I was really, I really always tried to help the West Coast artists come up by stocking them in my stores, having in stores with them, promoting them, giving them ideas for ways to promote their records, picking singles. Because of DJing, I had a pretty good ear, so of course I could pick singles. And a lot of times, um, the record labels, and to this day, sometimes labels will call me and say, hey, why don't you give this a listen and tell us what you think, what should be the single, or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that was always a lot of fun. Well, I know that was a, an exciting time, and was there a lot of resistance when you first started bringing some of this in? People thought it was a fad, and probably last a year or two oh yeah got a lot of that oh definitely you know uh people saying oh this isn't going to be around very long um you know that sort of thing a lot of haters um and a lot of those same people that i know are actually big hip-hop heads now and just love it you know but yeah there was a lot of that jay sure you know it's we're, we're looking 30 years on you know we just were with ice cube last Sunday, and we reminded him we're starting a celebration at IES this year for the 30th year, 30th anniversary when Andre Young met O'Shea Jackson. Do you do you remember? Obviously, Easy was the you know the businessman, but did do you remember when you first started seeing the spark that became Ice Cube and Dr. Dre? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know. Uh, People were talking about them already. You know, Eric was making a name for himself. Um, I knew Mark Cerami at Priority Records, and I was telling Mark that he just had to do something with them, you know. And uh, they ended up, you know, going to Priority and uh, signing their deal there and doing it. Well, we know what happened. I mean, um yeah, there was an atom bomb called Straight Outta Compton. Yeah, which, you know, I I feel so thrilled every time I look at the back of it and I see my name on such a legendary album, you know, giving me a thank you on there, you know. Sure. I, um, 
that's one of my all-time favorite albums, and I think it really started changing uh, things in not just the West Coast, but hip-hop in general, you know? Well, you know, we talked to Cube, and he said Dre actually didn't want F the Police on the record to begin with because he was already having some police problems hmm. and thought that that might exasperate you know, his, his uh, situation. That, that might have – maybe that was the case. The only thing that I really remember about Straight Outta Compton is uh, – Eric hated that song, Give Me Something I Can Dance To, you know, and every time it would come on, he would like, oh, oh no, you know, they they just, that wasn't a favorite for sure, and uh, I think he pretty much hated it. <laughs> wow, well, that was uh, certainly a uh, incredible time, you know, in history. Now, like I say, that we're 25, 30 years, 35 years from the beginning of this art form that people gave a few months or maybe a couple years max. It is turned into a culture that is just uh, inundating fashion and sports. Well, and, it's everywhere. And, you know, architecture and, I mean, just the club systems and, you know, everything that's out there. I mean, it's um, exciting to hear about the early days. And I know we're talking about, you know, legendary characters that made a lot of records. But in the early days, it was so modest, you know. I'm sure it was, you know, little recording systems and like you say i, I know mccola records was uh the pressing plant on santa monica boulevard here in hollywood and that became instrumental because they could actually press up oh yeah the music and there would be uh every day there would be people showing up at my job you know dropping off uh records that i would buy straight out of the trunk of their cars you know to put in my stores mm -hmm. um uh, that's how I met. Act that's how I met Hammer. You know, he came down from the Bay. A friend of mine um, uh, from the Bay, Daria, had uh, said that this guy wanted to meet me, and he came down and brought records, and I bought them directly out of the trunk of his car, um, twelve-inch vinyl, and um, you know, I started doing in stores with him in the Bay Area, and mm -hmm. there would be maybe fifty people show up. And then the next in store, there would be a hundred people show up. Then it got to where 500 people wrapped around the store was there to meet him and that sort of thing. And uh, Capitol Records was very um, interested in him at the time. And I had a friend over there named Rachel Matthews yeah. who had asked me to um, if I knew of anything that was really happening. And I said, yeah, there's this guy, you know, out of the bay that's really happening, MC Hammer. And she goes, well, she goes, why don't you – you know, give me his music. So I gave her his music. She didn't particularly like it, but she gave it to, I think we talked about this, yes. Wayne Edwards, I That's believe right. she gave it to. And uh, he made history over there by being the biggest selling uh, rap artist of the time. Well, you know? the story was that when they first approached him, you know, with what we all know is the, the sucker deal, <laughs> Hammer turned him down. He said, I'm making more out of my trunk than you're paying me. Yeah. And they had to get serious and come back. And, of course, they gave him his own label and, you know, better terms. And, you know, but he was an entrepreneur from the oh, beginning. Yeah. yeah. So and that's exciting make, to see. He would make big statements and say, I'm going to sell out the biggest arenas in the world and that sort of thing. And I remember being with him one day where tickets had gone on sale and there was the biggest arena at the time, I think, was in Japan. And he sold out in record Tokyo time. Dome. Like, yeah, in record time, you know, so... What's exciting? I mean, there was so many of those artists that, that you know were birthed from that. Like they say, the you know the legacy of NWA, the family tree that you can still to this day follow all those roots. It's amazing. Well, our guest tonight is Violet Brown. She's legendary. She's been around forever. We're talking about from the early days of hip hop all the way up into today's music. When we come back, we're going to be talking about what she's doing today. Strange music, Tech 9, all the incredible stuff that's going on in today's market, how it's changed, but how we feel it's actually better in a lot of ways. So we're coming right back with more on the road to Hollywood. Hey, what up? This is Corey from Slipknot. This is Matt Sorum from Velvet Revolver. What's up? It's your boy, Matt 1 0. Hey, this is Mike and from Nelson James. What's up? This is B Real from Cypress Hill. What's up? I'm Sean from Yellow Card. This your boy, Warren G. I'm Brooks Wackerman from Bad Religion. Hey, yo, this is Method Man. This is Mick Jones from Florida. I got a question for you. Are you serious about moving your 
creative career forward, then you need to be at IES. If you're a musician out there, you got a band, you want to rock, don't sit down on your ass and wait for someone to knock on your door. You can do it yourself. Don't wait for nobody. Do your thing, man. You know, life is short. You only live once. Totally independent and I love it. Everything's important about the indie world. It has been for a long time. You got more control and you make 10 times as much money. 10 times more money. Don't wait for the record label, do it yourself. People need to hear the music that's in your head, that's in your fingers, that's in your heart. So get out there and let's hear it. Because of the internet and because of the uh, greed of those old school executives at these record companies, the power is now in your hands, artists. Take back your art and don't sell yourself cheap or short to anyone. If you believe in your music, if you believe in your gift, if you believe what God has given you, make sure you go to I. Yes, show the world what you got. It's gonna be going down here in Los Angeles, and it's it's something that gets all you independent artists getting going on that drive, doing what you guys got to do, man. Be independent. Don't be afraid to be independent. You gotta be a part of doing you first, and that means independence. I implore you to go to the IES, the Independent Entertainment Summit, and do your thing. If you think you know what you're doing in this music business, I don't care who you are, there are things you will learn. The indie way is the way, you know? The large corporations have basically disintegrated. They're looking to the indie community to create the music and create the genesis of what's gonna be the next environment. If you started a new band and you're having a little bit of trouble figuring out where to go next or what you should be doing, who you should be talking to, whether you need a record label or how to get your music distributed, you need to go to the Indie Entertainment Summit. That's the place where you go to meet industry panel experts. They're going to tell you everything you need to know to get you where you want to be. For me, I spend all of my days and months going around the world educating musicians on how they can better actually release their music and market their music. It's part of my mission, it's part of the way that we can grow the music business. So I'm going to go at all the important summits that I can go to, and the Indie Entertainment Summit is going to be one of the places that I'll be. You want to be educated? You want me to help educate it? You better be there. Back with more on the road to Hollywood. Our special guest tonight is Violet Brown. We're in an exciting talk right now, actually visualizing the birth of, of hip-hop culture as we know it today. Now, she was based here on the West Coast, but the influence of this music has gone to Asia and Europe and Australia and South America and, you know, all over Africa and, and any, any planet, you know, that, that they, they can hear it. But, you know, we're talking about the early days. Uh, Violet, tell us about, you know, how you saw the evolution. Because I know at one time, how many stores did the warehouse have at the peak? Uh, I believe at our highest, maybe 550, something like wow. that. Wow, that's a yeah. lot of stores. You, you yeah. were a, a major national force. They were everywhere, more obviously yeah. than Tower. And you then know. Uh, when I went to work for Transworld Entertainment, we had uh, even more stores. I think there was like 800, 900 stores. So they stores, had gobbled like up that. a few yeah. other chains. Oh, and yeah, it was they, had a big... a, they were buying a lot of different chains. Yeah. Now, I know that that was hard for a lot of people because we know a lot of labels shut down, a lot of... Uh, mergers happen in the industry where we once had a lot of labels and a few artists now we have very few labels and everybody's an artist yeah talk about that transition and I know like I say just seeing kind of the demise of what the warehouse and then they turned into FYE here you know they, they were legendary here in Southern California just on Sunset alone we had Sunset in La Brea and Sunset in Western and up and down La Cienega at the Beverly Center and so many key parts of town had a warehouse um, how did you stay in, inspired and, you know, how, how did you keep seeing the light at the end of the tunnel as you transition from that to what you're doing with the independent world now? Well, like I said before, you know, I've always been a record collector, a music collector. So, you know, all of that is still there. You know, that's never changed. I've always loved music and I always will. And I think that with the Internet now, um, you know, it's really exciting because... Our artists, like back in the day, a West Coast artist was probably heard right here on the West Coast, and then maybe a record label would sign him, and maybe he would be heard somewhere else on the East Coast, South, or whatever. Nowadays, you know, any artist can put out a record. Today, right now, somebody's making a record, and it's going to go, it's going to be posted and downloaded and all that, and 
it's it can go all over the world in minutes. You know, so that's, I mean the Ukraine and, yeah, and that's so Portugal and ex- yeah, every it, everywhere tonight. It's so exciting, and I know you know we're sad that record stores closed and that sort of thing, and I'm sad about it that the record store isn't there where you can go hang out, and meet artists and things like that, and uh, you know listen to music all day, hear your favorite new stuff to buy, Just discover new. Yeah, people. but now you know if you think about it, there's record stores. 24 7 anytime you want right there just a click away you know you on your computer you could just and you can hear everything up. and i can hear a guy from australia you know or i can discover somebody you know from asia or something like that you know um so it's really exciting to be in music right now it's exciting uh, especially for indie artists because they really don't I mean, an artist really doesn't need the big machine anymore, yeah. you know? Um, and, and the fairy tale that they're going to give you a lot of money and do all the work for you and hand you the profit is, is a, you know, a fallacy anyway. So when it really comes down to it, who has a more vested interest in your career than yourself? Right. You know, so if you can build your fans, your revenue streams, your following, you know, your you know, you control your own destiny. Exactly. And, you know, a lot of people, they're always saying, well, I need the money to do this. You know, I need a budget or I need the label to front me the money or, you know, um, support me up front with marketing dollars and all that. But, I mean, now with the Internet, you can do all of this stuff, you know, for free, you yeah. know. Well, yeah, it's, it's just it's a lot of work. You know, it is a lot of work for the entrepreneurs that are out there, or the people that surround themselves with people. We just had the uh, CEO Dame Ritter of Funk Volume last week, and okay. what Hobson has done now, and Dizzy Wright. They've had two Double XL Freshman of the Year two years in a row, oh, yeah. and that's their first two artists, one and two. Yeah, we and they're had both. They're both major acts at Rock the Bells tour this oh, year. Oh yeah, we had Hobson out on our tours, you know, in the beginning. And sure. We love Strange Music loves Hobson. Oh yeah, no, it's so. so exciting, and let's talk about that. You know, today's business, the glass is definitely half full. There's more opportunities than ever. It's a different business, and it's interesting for those that have been involved like us to see the evolution. There's a new there's a new society, a new business, a new structure. All that is still formulating. It's like wet clay that may never actually harden. Yeah. yeah. And tell us about the exciting collaboration now. And obviously, you were uh, a buyer of, of Tech Nine. You saw him go through his hard deals with Quest Music and wherever else he was, uh, of course, with Mark Cerami, where they couldn't quite find it. And then now with Travis and Strange Music, they, they found their their angle and their niche and talk about how you decided to join forces with them and what's what's happening today well, let me tell you first about the way i met tech it's very much like we're doing right here you know tech was on the wake-up show mm. uh you know the independent wake-up show sway and tech's yep. wake-up show and uh i believe this was 93 around 93 he was on the wake-up show and um uh, I didn't always listen to the wake-up show every single week, but this particular week I was listening. And um, I heard Tech freestyling on the radio. Mm -hmm. And I had the inside phone number to call the station. And so I said, I had never called in to talk to an artist before, but I said, man, I want to talk to this guy. So Mm -hmm. I called in and uh, was able to talk to Tech on the phone, just was going crazy over his freestyling. And, um, you know, he was always in the back of my mind. This artist kind of stuck with me. And uh, one day when I was buying, I got a call from Travis O'Gwen because he had hooked up with uh, Tech. And uh, he said that they wanted to come by my office and talk to me. And I was so excited about tech coming by. You know, I just went nuts. And this was about the year 2000 or something. Mm -hmm. And so they came in and he gave me the demo of uh, Angelic, Mm -hmm. which blew my mind, Tech Nine's Angelic album. And I just couldn't believe it, you know. And as a matter of fact, he tells the story and he remembers it more than, I mean, I remember it when I listened to it for sure, but he remembers how it went down all the way. And what happened is uh, he left the tape with me because I was in the middle of a meeting. They got there kind of late and I was in another meeting. So he left the music for me and 
I listened to it later on that evening, and they were in a movie theater watching a movie, and I called them up and I said, oh, my God, uh, I want to – can you guys come back to my office tomorrow? And, I mean, this is blowing my mind, this album. And so they got pretty excited. They came back the next day. And ever since 2000, I've had a strong bond with strange music. And even when I was a buyer and doing my job every day as a buyer, I was kind of behind the scenes with strange music because I was making sure that my stores were always extremely stocked with it. Mm -hmm. You know, never over buying things, of course. I couldn't mm -hmm. never do that and I wouldn't do that, but I was making sure that, you know, it was in the right stores and that we had the right amount of product out there, making sure that wherever uh, tech started to break out, that the, my stores in that area was right there with the music. Um, well, talk about a little bit about his strategy, because obviously, you know, we celebrate his success story. We honored him at our very first IES Hip Hop Honors. He was the first hip hop artist ever inducted, and it was great to uh, get his feedback on that this year, you know, at, at paid dues. But what is the, the strategy you saw? Because obviously he's doing this without major radio support, Oh, yeah. Without major mainstream press or video support. And back in the day, that was it. If you didn't have radio or video play or mainstream press, the majors couldn't wait to get right. rid of you. So tell us how early you saw that strategy working and how methodical they built the market. Well, he's never been uh, a radio artist yet, you know, uh, 11, 12 years already. And the number one independent hip hop label, and a guy that sells out tours, you know, 250 days a year, if not more, uh, sells out everywhere across the country, across the world, actually. And he's never had a radio song. Um, but the thing about tech is he never stops touring. He's very hands on with the fans, he's out there meeting them at every single show. Uh, there's a meet and greet with, um, you know, a VIP tickets. And, you know, it's, it's not just a high priced ticket and we're trying to make money off these tickets. When you buy a VIP package from Strange Music, you get a lot of merch that comes with it. And we make special merch for this that you can't even buy, you know, limited edition stuff. Tech spends the whole couple hours before the show with them and anybody who's on our tour so when hobson was on the tour he was out there too mm -hmm. signing autographs uh when e40 and uh bone and that sort of thing they're out there too you know so we have the meet and greet they get the merch um they get to get into the theater a little bit early i mean there's a lot of stuff that comes with it you know so He's uh, very active on social media. He's always talking with his fans. You, uh, you can uh, come to the VIP and hand him tapes directly in his hand. Tech Nine is one of the owners of the label. Him and Travis O'Gwen own the record label. Of course, he's been offered a lot of deals. And back in the day, he took a couple of deals with Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. Uh, at Quest Records. He was with Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis at Perspective Records. He was involved with uh, Clive Davis. And uh, those records really didn't come out. You know, he got mixed up in that line of people, you know, waiting to come out, and the records never came out. So he was disenchanted with the whole major label record business. So they wanted to do it themselves, and they've been extremely successful. He's not the guy that's going to sign a record deal somewhere. He's going to keep it himself. Uh, we have a huge compound in headquarters in Kansas City, Missouri, where we're based at, that uh, is just so above any other record label headquarters I've ever been in, and I've seen it all through the years. I mean, it's if anybody ever gets out to Kansas City, if you're an artist or a producer or somebody involved in the music industry and you get out that way towards Kansas City, please go by our offices and take a look at this place. Mm -hmm. I'm just so proud of it every time I'm there, you know, and we're opening up our studios where we're going to be filming and uh, recording our albums. And it's state of the art studio. Travis O'Gwen visited studios all around the world 
and came up with designs and people that he found to build this studio and it's opening soon uh, strange land studios in kansas city missouri it's in a different complex uh different compound sort of building and uh, you know tech and travis have done this on their own you know we own our tour buses we own our merch company we don't have to go somewhere and buy stuff somewhere else we own it he owns everything and he's done it himself and it's through a lot of hard work dedicated people um and you know a great group back in kansas city uh the office people are fantastic and uh tech you know really gets out there and lives and breathes everything with his fans fans are everything to tech and uh, that's why he can sell like he does, sell out tickets, sell out shows, sell music, debut at number one without advertising because we have a huge fan base and we have a lot of our fans, which we call technicians, our uh, street teams across the world, basically, that promote our albums. And, you know, we don't really have to do a lot of outside marketing anymore and we hit number one and it's based on the loyalty uh, of our fans well it's exciting to see that shift to power because the big record companies were getting fat and rich and lazy they were all gobbling each other up where there was once 50 labels there was three and I, i'm looking at the the two major conglomerates left sony and and Universal, one's French and one's Japanese. Even the Warner Music Group, which is unaffiliated with Warner Films and TV, is owned by a Russian guy. Yeah. So to see the independents start from scratch, we, we see so many artists coming up today that, that want a shortcut. They want somebody to hand them some money, go be rich and famous, be a rock star, and, and play a bunch of you know games, and, and somehow be handed the profits. But you see an artist like Tech and the new evolution today, Hobson, a lot of these guys in their own smaller degrees now, where they're hustling harder than major label, major stars, and they have a stake in there what they do. They're getting paid from record one, not that crazy recoupment, you know, from the record deals. Right. And it's amazing that not everyone has still gotten the, the word that, you know, why are you in such a hurry to sign away all your ownership, all your control? And in essence, probably all your future profits, if you never recoup, you know, to someone else when this is your career, you know, right. you should be the CEO, you should be at least a part of, you know, what you do. And of course, in Tech's case, he, he found his perfect partner, you know, that could handle the business while he stayed on the road and kept pace, you know, with making new music and everything. It's, it's a real exciting to see this new paradigm. But um, do, you, do you find it frustrating sometimes that there's still at the, at the bottom, the, you know, the younger generation, they're still looking for the record deal and, and in a real hurry to sign with anyone that calls himself the label? Well, I think they're getting pretty smart, though. You know, a yeah. lot of Slowly them are a lot of eyes have been on Tech 9 and Strange Music. A lot of eyes are on Funk Volume and Hobson. Mm -hmm. And people are really watching, you know, they're watching Top Dog and that yeah. sort of thing. And uh, I, I don't think they're in the hurry that they were maybe five, eight years ago to sign with major labels, yeah. you know. Um, it's getting better, but, but still, you know, uh, like Tech says, it's not easy to spend millions of dollars, you know, on, on what you do because everything in an essence is a risk but he's built that loyalty so it's pretty pretty consistent but you know to see an artist that wants somebody else to give them money and then invest and somehow think they have a stake or control or really any hand in the business unfortunately in an old-fashioned record deal the artist was the last one to get paid yeah everything and recoup before them I, I tell you a lot of people really we have about 12 artists on our label on strange music and we keep our artists very happy because they do get paid at strange travis is meticulous about everything with this company and that's paying the bills you know everybody gets paid like clockwork like i've had producers and such call me up and say oh my god i got a check i got my first check from strange music mm -hmm. you know i see them post it you know take pictures of their checks and put it on facebook and that sort of thing you know yeah. instagram they're still because, waiting for that major label one a year ago <laughs> <laughs> right 
Um, but, you know, we're really known for taking care of our artists, keeping them happy. We spend, you know, we don't spend a lot of money on uh, traditional marketing anymore, but we do put a lot of money into our recordings, our packaging, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, we do spend a lot of money on our artists and a lot of money on releases, just not, we don't have to really do the traditional marketing anymore. Yeah, you don't need the billboards and the, all the well, TV ads. And... Although, if you go into Kansas City or into the Midwest, when a Tech 9 album or when any of our albums are coming out, you're going to see billboards, gigantic ones, with yeah. tech everywhere. You know, When I go, although we, we say that tech doesn't have radio, in Kansas City, he sure does have radio when a record comes out. You know, you'll hear him on the radio like you would hear a Jay-Z or whatever at the time, but mm -hmm. just right there, you know, and it's not the typical radio type song, you know, they'll pick just, you know, favorite songs off the album, that sort of thing. They aren't really records that were shopped to them necessarily as singles, yeah. you know. So he never felt like if I sell out, so to speak, and, and, and get the hooks and, and this and that, I might sell more because, again, his audience likes the fact that he's uncompromising. Oh, yeah. And, you know, tech would never do anything to sell out, you know, at all. You know, each um, album, you know, he does everything. He does all the writing. It's all his ideas always. You know, when he's out on the road, he's thinking about what he's going to do when he gets back or else he's recording while he's on the road. And, um, you know, he's just, uh, you know, an incredible, unique artist, you know. And a lot of big stars are stepping to us wanting to work with tech or wanting to be on strange music now, you know. Um so it's it's quite uh, it's it's a good place to be, you know. I love being at Strange Music, and a lot of the big artists, legendary artists, you know, are coming to us because they're hearing about. Yes, we do pay our artists. We do put you out on the road in some great tours. You know, you will be seen. You know, a lot of artists they want our fan base to love them. You know, so they're coming to us. How do we get that? Can we be a part of strange music? Can we, you know, uh, be on Tech's uh, coattails on the tour, that sort of thing? Well, that's so exciting to hear. Again, our guest tonight is Violet Brown. She's got a history and a half in the music business. We love hearing about it. You know, there's so many of these legendary times and characters now that, you know, the business has shifted so much. And she's right there in this indie world that we love so much. As, as we get back, we're going to talk about, of course, the IES conference and festival coming up. We're going to talk about techniques and some of the success tips of how to network and really build those relationships today. Because because Tech Nine's doing it this way, you might have to find your own niche or, you know, uh, all sorts of success stories. Mac Miller's got his way. Macklemore went on the radio and he's winning it his way. So you really have to find your own path. When we come back, we're going to be talking about what's coming up in the future, and of course, seeing you at IES, coming right back on the road to Hollywood. If you rap, sing, dance, model, DJ, or act, or like myself, do comedy, you can't afford to miss this conference. You're trying to do your thing in this business, and you're tired of waiting on somebody to help you, and all this coming that late, the indie entertainment summer. You know what time it is, man. It's that time, Rolex time. Chasing cash, get money, get care. Shout out to Hit Boy G Rock, Mike Making Mad, Stacy B, it's Sir Cup, and we here with the Indie Entertainment Summit, man. Y'all need to be here, man. It's in LA in August, man. Beautiful people here, man. Dropping knowledge, dropping gems about this new way to pursue this music and a new way to get this money, man. It's the Indie Entertainment Summit. That's the IES, baby. Very important place to be if you want information to take things to the next level. You may not have access to the internet. It's okay, too. Go there. You have an opportunity, IES. Write it, rap it, produce it, mix it, arrange it, wrap it, sell it. That gives you the power. Every second that you're sitting on your butt waiting for something good to happen, your competition is passing you by. So uh, if you got a dream, go and fight for it and support Indie Entertainment Summit. I need y'all to come out to my city and represent with the Entertainment Indie Summit 
is going down August 1st through the 5th. If you're an independent artist, you're an independent label, you want to get your music out there, you want to network, come out to Los Angeles. Go to IES Conference in LA, Google it, you gotta be there. Showcases, panels, opportunities, everything that Indie Entertainment Summit does is something that is very much for today's music industry. We know how it used to be, but we don't know how it's going to be tomorrow. But I think the Indie Entertainment Summit is going to be an opportunity for motivated, ambitious professionals to meet each other. Music business is a hard thing to break into. So you gotta do what you can, check out IES, Indie Entertainment Summit. If you're gonna be anywhere, you need to be at IES, man, in LA, man. That's where it's gonna be at. It's going down just like that, August 1st through the 5th. IES, man. If you ain't going to IES, you ain't gonna live to be an artist. You know why? IES, feed your mind, feed your soul, get a good lawyer, they'll teach you which way to go. If you're serious about your music, where do they need to be? You gotta be at IES, yo. What's that? Indie Entertainment Summit. You should check it out at IES.com. Uh, hopefully this will become an annual event that we'll all be going to many years from now. You need to be out to IES. That's IES, baby. Going down August 1st through the 5th. You have to check out IES. IES, show the world what you got. Ain't no excuses. It's now or never. It's your chance to show the world what you got. IES. I hope I see you there. The uh, Indie Entertainment Summit, man. Sir, uh, we're going to be there. Indie motherfucking Entertainment Summit. Be there, Jack. IES. Look for it online. The Indie Entertainment Summit. If you really think you got what it takes to stand out, you really want to make sure you stand out, you can show the world what you got at the IES, the Indie Entertainment Summit. IES, it's going to be here in Los Angeles. Entertainment capital of the world. <laughs> if you ain't there, you're nowhere. That's right. IES is coming up August 7th to the 11th. So no matter where you are, Anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, we had people from over 20 countries. All 50 states were represented. We are starting something that is very special. It speaks directly to how to earn and learn and grow in this business. We're talking about these success stories like Tech 9 Macklemore, Mac Miller, Joe Bonamassa in the blues field, and so many artists. You're, you're seeing people really create a new a new revolution a new evolution of the music business and we're very excited to be able to put this on in los angeles where so many of the great movers and shakers are you know it's very difficult to get violet down to the studio and o over to the conference but it's at least it's right here in la they don't have to travel and you know we're so excited to have uh, a full course this year and uh, Violet we thank you so much for coming down at our, our inaugural uh, you probably didn't know what to expect I know Brian Chafton reached out to you and you know what we loved was just the you know the openness of people that you know coming into a new situation you know you hope for the best and to really see people come in and embrace these new dynamics they're not looking for a record deal they're looking how to learn from the others that are succeeding today and that's an exciting time yeah, when I uh, went there, like you said, I didn't know what to expect, and I expected to go in and maybe spend an hour or something. I was on a panel with the legendary Jerry Heller, and uh, Steve LaBelle was on the panel, and so I thought I would go in, you know, say my piece, and out the door. And I went in, and I loved the panel that I was on, <clears throat> so I decided I'm going to stick around for the next one stuck around for the next one next thing you know i spent i think three days At with least. uh the conference <laughs> it was awesome i couldn't believe that something so powerful and something so beneficial to people was happening right here you know in in our in our city you know in los angeles through the years i've been to so many conferences there was you know the new music seminar in new york and jack the rapper wherever it was that particular year atlanta or whatever urban network convention so many BRE uh, and yeah gavin bre and gavin so, so many, many conferences you know and i really you know that time kind of went away there wasn't any more conferences so when this one came along you know i was happy that something was happening but i really didn't expect it to rival some of the biggest conferences that i had been to especially in the first year, 
You know, I I expected a disorganized mess, and that's just not what I found there. And I was like, man, if they can pull this off in the first year, what are they going to do next year here? Just think where we can grow it. If we bring that positive energy, people that are out there creating these success stories on their own, share that information. You know, that's what's so great about the indie scene is, unlike the major labels or sports teams that are real secretive yeah. and hide their information, yeah. the indies are very free in sharing mm -hmm. their success. Because like I say, you can't replicate what somebody else did, but you might be able to learn from it, give your own twist on it, and find your own angle. The, the one thing that I loved about it, too, is a lot of the conferences through the years, they've been urban-based, and I worked in urban music, so I was really happy about that but i like all genres as well and i love indie music in particular you know i've always had an affection for indie music always loved it and so to go there to this conference and to see rock bands sitting next to rappers and talking about production together and to see a country girl that flew in or drove in from Nashville to be at the conference and to meet a kid, um, Winston Anthony, that I met from New Zealand. New Zealand. You know, I think Randy Boston. Uh, yeah. 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 We had people coming Just, in from all coasts, Europe, Asia. They came from all the different continents. And we're going to keep that growing because, like you say, with the Internet, there are more opportunities. Like, you know, Hobson's guys were saying, you, next thing you know, Australia wants you. You go over and do five dates over here, and now Germany wants you. And oh, it's yeah. so exciting to really, you know, our, our goal for the conference was to bring people together, share that information, and spur collaborations. Yeah. Because we're already seeing so many success stories in the first year of, you know, people jumping on tours and collaborations together, and these guys hooked up with these. And like you say, there's there's artists talking to you that probably never would have gotten your phone number or gotten through to you, but now they made some kind of impression, and maybe you can do something, maybe you can't, but now they have, again, connections in the industry that this door may open to that one, and, you know, we're so excited to see where people can really build yeah, their own I would say brands. a good percentage of my uh, Twitter uh, followers and friends and such I met at IES. You know, it was tremendous how many people I actually met there and connections I made and that sort of thing, you know. Well, that's exciting. Now, uh, you know, by day what we do is really try and give people the knowledge. And this isn't all about again, pie in the sky radio or something like that, we cover all the bases, mm -hmm. you know, so how to make better music, how to make better videos, how to get your music monetized on YouTube, how to go through the social media and how to build your brand and your image and be out there still in the streets. The, the guerrilla marketing is still not dead. Even though we do some of it virally, the streets and, and there are stores still and there's festivals and there's so many opportunities today that's exciting to link it all up. But you know, one of the great things that we do at IS is we do the honors. And and not only do we try and connect people where they have an opportunity to meet through our thing called Deal Link, where they're one on one meetings with decision makers and people in the industry that might be looking for talent. But at the honors, we love to celebrate the trailblazers. And and what's amazing is a lot of these artists are obvious. They were popular but what we found out later is they were the black sheeps. They weren't getting invited to the Grammys and the BET Awards and the American Music Awards. That's the one thing that Tech Nine said to us at Pay Dues. We asked him, what did it mean, you know, to uh, be honored, you know, at the IS Hip Hop Honors among the independents? And he said it meant a lot because he never got invited to those big award shows. And to him, it's the people in the indie community that mean the most to him. You know, we all saw the fickle people in the major label mentality that, you know, were here and there and in radio, very phony, you know, everybody's out for themselves. But in any community, there's a camaraderie. And the first year, we inducted Tech 9 We inducted, of course, Spice One, who was a mentor to Tupac and so many great artists in the Bay. We inducted the Alcoholics. They came, you know, J-Roll came straight off the plane from Sweden, right from LAX to the venue. And we had no idea besides accepting this honor, these guys were going to rock the house. 
and that they did. Alcoholics blew it, blew it out the door and paved the way for Chino XL, one of the most underrated, one of the most talented lyricists ever, who I know is good friends with Tech 9 and you know, we see his influence in Eminem and so many great artists over the years. So to honor these people and to hear back, they, they really appreciated it because you know, they knew it wasn't phony. Yeah. That, that meant a lot to them. Yeah. And to be able to sit there, you know, and be just uh, a few feet away from Chino XL and the alcoholics and that sort of thing, just up there spitting crazy energy, you know, it was incredible. And, you know, a lot of the new artists that came in, uh, that drove in, flew in or whatever, they were able to get up there. And I was sure. able to see a lot of them perform. You know, besides the great panels at the IES uh, conference, there's a lot of entertainment, a lot of shows, you know, and, uh, you know, I met some singer songwriters there that were just mind blowing. I couldn't believe it. You know, one of them, I think, was 15 years old or something. Oh, yeah. and Major Major. We had him on the on the show. Oh, well, yeah, that kid. But there was a singer songwriter like a like one a Taylor others. Swift sort okay, of girl sure. that I met there. Yeah, it was amazing songwriter. Just incredible. It's, it's so exciting. Like I say, uh, don't think that this is a local show, no matter where you are. Please try and make plans because, again, when you're hearing the testimonials of those that were there, and we really want to keep this growing, we really want you here. At, not only are you going to be able to learn, you know, and learn to earn, you know, more than you're doing now, but you're going to be able to open up some connections and some opportunities and some collaborations that you may never have had before. So it's priceless in that regard. We've kept the costs and everything really low for people to really be able to appreciate this. You know, we see a lot of these conferences just gouging people to showcase and this and that. And we've kept this real reasonable. Well, one of the things we want to talk about tonight as we get to wrap up is not only uh, how important it is to be there, you know, at IS, that's August 7th through the 11th, but the first day this year, you know, we, we do our inauguration, we go through an incredible day of the most knowledgeable people in this business, but the IES Hip Hop Honors this year is very special, and we really, really um, are excited, you know, and every year we want to try and top ourselves, which is amazing when we set the bar so high, but because they meant so much to everybody, and we have Violet in the house, and we have the opportunity to reunite so many of the people that were around them, you know, in their, in their camp, that we are inducting and honoring NWA this year. And of course, that is Dr. Dre, Ice Cube, MC Ren, DJ Yella. I mean, we, we want to, you know, from, um, you know, Arabian Prince to everybody involved. Donovan, the dirt biker Smith, who, of course, taught Dre and Yella how to make records. Uh, of course, Madeline Smith, who handled all the publishing and the sample clearances. And, you know, so many great people from their camp, you know, we want to uh, bring together. And we can never tell who's going to walk through the door. So, you know, this is not Coachella. This is actually uh, a conference all about being independent. But we're, we're honoring who we feel is a, a major trailblazer. And we're going to do a case study of a success story about Straight Outta Compton and talk to the people that actually helped make that record. Who shot the cover? Who they made the video? Who mixed it? You know, everybody that had a part in that, we're going to bring some of the key executives from Priority that really made that happen and brought that to the world. But in addition to that, we're having a very special honor to the late great soldiers that we've lost. And that, of course, is Eazy -E, a foundational part of NWA. That is Tupac, one of the greatest of all time. That is Nate Dogg, who is still so fresh in our minds, so, so vital to that NWA family tree and everybody that's come from it. And even ODB. We have very special people from the Wu-Tang family and Old Dirty Bastards uh, crew that want to make this very special. And of course, Pimp C and UGK. Bun B's coming out from Houston. We're going to honor Bun and the legacy of UGK, the foundation, the true king of the South. We are going to honor and induct Bone Thugs in Harmony. They have to be a part of this Easy e tribute. We're going to induct and honor DJ Quick, Cypress Hill, and of course, Violet Brown. Violet, we, we look forward to honoring you this year, along with Chang Weisberg, who is the CEO and founder of Gorilla Union. Of course, the producers of Rock the Bells, Paid Dues, and Smoke Out. So it's going to be our honor to have you here. 
It's going to be so special. We want to try and create a night that we all remember yeah, forever. It's going to be an honor to be there. And, you know, I might suggest one more thing, too, if we could do something for Mac Dre, you know? That would be, would be great. awesome. So. We're, we're definitely going to add him there. That's Violet's request. Thank you so much. IES Fest, F E S T, is the website. We're coming back next week with so much more knowledge and information on the road to Hollywood.